Hi, we'll get started. Um, my name is Dr. Anita Palapu. I'm with Internal Medicine here at St. Paul's Hospital, and I'll be moderating these sessions of the Own Your Health St. Paul's Community Forum. Um, so every month, the third Wednesday of each month, we have this community forum where you have an opportunity to ask medical experts uh, questions and hear about updates and um, innovations that are happening at Providence Healthcare. It takes place every third Wednesday between 7 and 9 p.m. The doors will open around 6.30, and what we like to do is uh, about an hour where the presentation will occur, and then the next half hour is an opportunity for you to ask questions. We will have, you have those pink sheets, and what we'll do is after the presentations, we'll come around and collect them, and then on your behalf, I will ask the questions. So what I'm, I may ask you to do is try to make it just one question and be as clear as it can be, not leaving me to interpret or decipher so, so that I can uh, make sure I ask what you want to know. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Kusk and Dr. Van Laken speak today, and I'm going to do a brief introduction of both. I'd also just like to acknowledge that BC Hydro is going to uh, record, uh, sponsor the recording of this session, and so this will also be podcasted. So if you have friends who couldn't make it tonight, um, you can direct them to the Providence Healthcare website and the BC Hydro website and be able to see this uh, presentation. So the first speaker will be Dr. Uh, Kusk, who's a general surgeon and an associate clinical professor in surgery with, who has subspecialized practice in breast disease and oncology. Her hospital practice is at Providence Healthcare in Vancouver, and she also has surgical privileges at the BC Cancer Agency and with Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, she's the medical director of the Rapid Access Breast Clinic at Mount St. Joseph's Hospital. Her current research interests involve breast cancer prevention as well as collaborative activities with the BC Cancer Agency regarding clinical trials with tissue culture studies. She has personal interests which include uh, gardening, bonsai, travel, and reading. Um, she's a graduate of UBC Medical School and a Canadian Fellowship um, with General Surgery and a Fellow of the American College of Surgeons. She's also a, a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons. So Dr. Usk will speak first and just to have the flow be easy. I'll also introduce Dr. Van Laken, who's sitting up front, and you can see her when she does the rest of the presentation. Um, so she's a fully certified plastic surgeon and is a member of the Canadian Society of Plastic Surgeons as well as the Canadian Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Um, she graduated from medical school at University of Ottawa and obtained her plastic surgery uh, training at University of British Columbia. She's currently the head of the Department of Surgery at Providence Healthcare and is the associate head of the Department of Surgery at University of British Columbia. She's a clinical associate professor um, at, with the Division of Plastic Surgery at UBC, an active member of staff at the BC Children's and Women's um, Hospital. And she also operates at various lower mainland facilities, including St. Paul's, Mount St. Joseph's, and she specializes in cosmetic and reconstructive plastic surgery and is very involved in breast reconstruction and very relevant. And she'll show some really interesting slides um, during her presentation. So i just like to also say that there's lots of material out front afterwards that you can take a look at, and there'll be refreshments afterwards so you have an opportunity to mingle and talk. So we'd like you to pick up all the materials that you find interesting. And just to say that on October 21st, our next um, session will be on healthy aging and elder care and fall. So within your networks, if you know people who may be interested, please um, have them come to that session. Thank you. So I'll hand it over to Jeff. Good evening. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad to see some people made it out in the in the lousy lousy weather. Now, my job is to give you a crash course in the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. There's not a test at the end, and be aware. There's a. I'm going to send you with a lot of information. It's almost over information, but at least it may give you the bits and pieces that you want to know. Now, breast cancer presents in the pretty simple way that everybody knows about. That you can get a lump, there can be changes in the skin. One of the biggest ways we want to see people coming in with breast cancer is actually on a mammographic abnormality. If we can pick it up at this stage, it's going to be a lot earlier than the other stages. And nipple discharges, inversion, or scaling, those are the things we ask you to look out for. On the other hand, most of the things that we tell you to look out for are actually not cancer. Most of the lumps are benign, most of the nipple discharges are okay. So cyclic hormonal nodularity, fibrocystic breast, cyst, fibrous areas, all these things are actually way, way, way commoner than cancer. Although everybody hears about breast cancer. So when a woman goes into the office, and usually it's their primary care provider that's the per first person that's the, the, 
the hysterical woman walks with, I think I've got a cancer, I think I've got a cancer, I've got a lump. They're the ones that sort of go to work and figuring out what it is. And I've kind of given you a little sort of sketch of what they're looking for when they see you. Because remember, really what they're trying to do is pick out those few people that have a breast cancer out of all those people that have benign lumps that come into the office, which are probably at least 20 to 1. And the first thing, it depends on their experience, is kind of the risk assessment. How old are you, which is a really big thing, because the younger you are, the less likely to have breast cancer. What's your family history? What does this thing feel like? And that's what comes on experience from both anybody who's practiced in dealing with lumps. Some of things actually feel like cysts, and other things feel ugly at the beginning, and then there's the in-between. Usually you're sent for some sort of imaging, and the imaging can be an ultrasound or a mammogram, depending on your age and what's appropriate. And when I put histology, sometimes you really need to know what it is, so you need a bit of that tissue, and ways of getting bits of tissue go from needle biopsies to core biopsies to open biopsies, again, depending what's appropriate. Now, I've given a little tiny bit of a graph here, and really what it's trying to tell you is if you're under 35, you're not likely to get a mammogram first, you're likely to get an ultrasound, and if you're over the 35, but that's, that's not a fixed age. It could be 30, it could be 32, I'm just, younger people get an ultrasound, older people will first get a mammogram, and then it depends what they find. It can be, I forgot to bring a, a thing, it can be a cyst, which they forget about. If it's suspicious, no matter how old they are, you need to do, they need to be investigated. And then the mammograms will also shift, shift people out as to it's okay or it's not okay. So it's, as you can see, a lot of these things are negative. It's only in the far side, obviously, where things start to get positive. But there is a, a way of going through step by step to figure out what it is that you've got. Now this is showing you a cyst. So, you're 45 years old, you have a new lump, it hurts, you go to your family doctor, they do a mammogram, they do an ultrasound, the radiologist sees this, sees this specific picture on their ultrasound, they go, you're fine, be gone. Because this is a clinical picture of a cyst that they can just say, we know this is okay. <coughs> sometimes, just to be sure, or sometimes it's symptomatic, we can drain these cysts. And this is just showing you me putting a needle into a cyst. You can see the fluid that's come out of that, that syringe. It empties out, uh huh, thank you. It em this, this empties out, the whole lump is gone, it's a cyst, everybody goes home happy. And that's actually really nice for me to do in the office because those people go out happy instead of going, oh, what do I do next? <laughs> this is showing you a mammogram. I mean, women that have had mammogram know what it's like, but it's kind of basically giving you the idea that you go in there and you're, you're compressed. And they compress you in two different ways, but that's how they take the pictures. That's how they have the good pictures of the breast. This is showing you an abnormal mammogram. And right, hang on here. Right here, the, the radiologist is finding a tiny wee lump. This thing is way too small for you to even hope to feel. And this is where mammography comes in. Now, just to interject a point here, this is what the whole point of the Mount St. Joe's rapid access clinic is. You come in, you have a screening mammogram from the screening program, the radiologist will see this, they'll go, okay, I need to do something about this. Quickly they get you in for whatever else you need, another mammogram, an ultrasound, a core biopsy, and you can get a diagnosis on this thing pretty quickly. Because we certainly know from our knowledge of, especially my knowledge of what goes on in the city, most of the time you get this and then Oh, a few weeks later, you see your family doctor, and then a few weeks later, you get another test, and a few weeks later, you get another test, and all of a sudden, three months have gone by, and you still don't know what you've got. So the whole point of our clinic is to speed up the process, and so far, it has actually worked fairly well. So to let everybody know, we're all trying to make a difference in the whole way how we can manage you quicker. Mammographic abnormalities, as I said, is where... We, as surgeons and those people who work with cancer, want to see you. They don't want to see you before you can feel the lump the size of an orange. That's much, much harder to treat, much worse outcome than something like the size of that mammogram where it's the size of a peanut or smaller. But when you have a mammographic abnormality, again, most of them are not cancer. So to give you an idea, out of every 1,000 mammograms, depending on your age, they will pick up four cancers. It's not like there's a lot of cancers picked up on a mammogram, and for every one of those cancers, there's probably 20 or 30 abnormal mammograms that the radiologist has to shift through to make the diagnosis. When we see it, we rely on the advice from the radiologist. This is their area of expertise. And really, what 
advice they give depends on the degree of suspicion that they have when they look at the pictures. And they may be, when you get a mammographic abnormality, they will send a little piece of paper to the radiolog to the family doctor and say, okay, they need magnification views, they need an ultrasound, they need to have certain things done to make a diagnosis. Now this is showing the magnification views. When you're squished in that mammogram, they can squish you even harder, and you can see in here there's a little area, they magnify them up and they look at those and they say, in all honesty, this looks like a breast cancer. So if the radiologist had a picture like that, they would say, okay, move on, do something. <coughs> When they have a mammographic, when you have a mammographic abnormality, there's a number of options for getting a diagnosis. The radiologist looks at it and says, "This is really suspicious. This could be a cancer. Figure out what to do." The simplest thing is to have an ultrasound, and if they can see it on ultrasound, they can do a needle aspiration biopsy and under ultrasound. If they think it's maybe a cyst, and that's easy to solve, a core biopsy, a fine. But if they come to the surgeon, if they can't for any other reason get a diagnosis or for reasons you need to do, we can do what's called a fine wire biopsy under ultrasound. The radiologist marks the spot and we cut it out. If the abnormality is only seen on a mammogram, it kind of limits your options a bit more. You can either get a special stereotactic core biopsy done by the radiologist or you can cut it out. <coughs> this is showing you, again, this is a piece of a mammogram. This is showing you an abnormality which actually looks pretty benign to the radiologist, got nice little sharp walls, but they will look at it and say, it's kind of fuzzy here and kind of fuzzy here. It doesn't meet the criteria of something completely benign. They have sent the patient for an ultrasound. These are all courtesy of my friend Paula Gordon, who then sees a lump which is solid. It doesn't look like a black hole like the last one you saw. This is a solid lump. So the radiologist will say, okay, it looks pretty round, it looks pretty smooth, but it's a solid lump. Any solid lump may be a cancer. You need some sort of a the biopsy. So those are the kind of pictures they're looking at. <coughs> this is what a, a core biopsy under ultrasound is like. The woman lies there. This is the probe that they put on top to see what the what the to locate the abnormality, and they'll come sideways and take a needle biopsy or a core biopsy of that <laughs> of that lump or the, the abnormality that's there. Stereotactic biopsy is way more interesting. There's two. <laughs> when you have an abnormality in the mammogram, you can't feel it. Remember, this is something they can see on the mammogram. So, in order for them to localize the radiologist, to localize the exact spot, it has to be a special machine. There's two kinds of machines. One's a suit up, but the a lot of the machines are lie down machines. So the woman lies down, breast hangs out. There's this little console here that will go around, and the computer will say, "Okay, this is this is where you get it." Now, there are obviously restrictions to this. If you have a little old lady that can't lie on her stomach, she cannot actually do this procedure. So like I said, there's some various reasons that not everybody can have one of those core biopsies. They have to be able to tolerate the machine. They're, they have to have to they have to be able to see it properly in the mammogram, certain positions they can't. So it's not like everybody can do this. But ideally, most women with a mammographic abnormality can have some sort of a needle core biopsy to figure out what it is. And actually, we surgeons prefer that first because then we know what to do because most of those people will not need an operation. If they do, then at least we have an idea of what we're dealing with first to optimize what we're going to do next. <coughs> then we come to the surgical biopsy, and this is showing you this little area of calcifications in this woman's breast. What the radiologist has done is he's, under the mammogram, put a little wire a needle in with the wire, and that marks the exact spot for us. What the surgery involves is we make a little incision here after the patient's asleep or frozen. We kind of don't tell you to bite the bullet. And take this area out. We x-ray the piece to make sure you get the right piece because you can imagine this wire might move a little. You may, it may not be, stay exactly where it is because it's put in a few hours before the surgery. We x-ray the piece, and indeed we have these calcifications, and they're actually a little more obvious on the piece that, that we've taken out. And I will tell you that this is a ductal carcinoma and situ and early cancer as well. The nipple discharge. Lots of people have nipple discharge. Lots of people at both sides. It's after lactation. There's many reasons. I would say 95% of nipple discharges don't mean anything. They're quite benign. What I have put here is which ones do we worry about? If they're clear, like water, and they keep pouring out in your post, especially postmenopausal, if they're bloody and they're spontaneous and they're from one duct. So really, one duct, spontaneous, bloody, or clear, we pay attention. Even those are mostly not cancer, but those are the those are the ones that are possible. 
If you're postmenopausal, it has a little bit more impact because it's not hormonal. And if there's a lump associated with it, it's cancer until proven otherwise. <coughs> and again, we have this little graph here. That's what I said. If you have a lump, you look after the lump. It takes priority over the discharge. If the, if the discharge is milky, if it's colored, almost all of these, as you can see, we don't expect anything significant to come out of it. If it's that one I told you about clear, it's bloody out of one duct, then the patient's a mammogram. And as you can see, most of the time, they get removed if they meet those criteria of being worrisome. But 5 or 10% or of them can be a cancer. On the other hand, you don't want to ignore it. This is just showing a galactogram, which we don't do very often, but this is showing you breast. This is showing you the radiologist putting dye down the nipple, and we don't do it very often because sometimes it doesn't work, and it's really not a fun thing to have done. And this is showing you a little tumor within that duct of the nipple. So that's the diagnosis. I'm sure you all understand how it's done now. <laughs> what, kind of, what types of breast cancer can you have? And it's actually pretty simple. It's either in situ, which means it has not been able to spread outside the ducts. It's located within the breast. It can't spread anywhere. And there's two kinds of in situ, lobular and ductal, because the breast is really made out of the ducts, the end of the lobules at the end that make the milk, and then all the other stuff around it. Or the breast cancer is invasive. Again, it start, can start in the ducts, it can start in the lobules, and then there's other things, rare other things, sarcomas, lymphomas, carcinosarcomas. They start in the tissue outside the ducts. And actually, most of these are not good news, but they're very rare. The ductal carcinoma in situ, I think it's the same picture you saw, you almost always picked up on a mammogram. These are things that are so early, they haven't formed lumps, and this is where screening mammogram really is helpful because it will pick up a lot of things before it has the ability to spread elsewhere and do you grave harm. <coughs> Ductal carcinoma in situ is a very curable thing treated right. As you can see here, these are, these are, not, these are old numbers, and in this era here, everybody had a mastectomy. That was the treatment of any kind of cancer. But you can see that the death due to carcinoma in situ, and this was when they had mastectomies and nothing else, is extremely low. And if you look at this column and this column, the chance of dying of heart disease or your breast cancer in 10 years is a draw. So the chance is less than 2%, but it's a draw. So treated right carcinoma in situ, we consider 98% curable. What kind of surgery will we do for this? If it's small, you can have a lumpectomy, and small being less than five centimeters. Now, five centimeters is about two inches, if those people that aren't into metric. Usually, you need radiation afterwards, so you actually have to combine the partial mastectomy with radiation if you want a reasonable outcome. And there's lots of other little gray figures in here that we individualize patients on exactly how big is it, what grade is it, all sorts of stuff that we take into consideration. You will need a total mastectomy, or we would prefer to tell you you need a total mastectomy, if it's greater than five centimeters. Why? Because it tends to come back with a lumpectomy. It's, it's, it's a matter of if you want to get those 98% cures, we have to do the right thing. If there's more than one, but then there's also what I throw in patient choice. Some people will have a small carcinoma in situ. They'll say, hmm, I don't want the radiation. I don't, want it. I don't want to worry about it. I would rather have the whole breast off with maybe a reconstruction. That becomes their choice. And there's actually nothing much wrong with that choice. <coughs> what kind of surgeries we do? Like I said, this is your mini course here. And I have sort of lumped them together because, in all honesty, there isn't one surgery for one person. It's kind of a mix and match depending on who you are, what you've got, how big is it, where is it, and what your preference is. There's fine wire guided partial mastectomies for the lumps that, remember, you couldn't feel. There's partial mastectomies for lumps that you can feel. There's total mastectomies. And then we're into what happens with the lymph nodes, and there's two choices there. And then there's reconstructive options. So you may have this matched with this or this matched with this, or one of those, or a mastectomy matched with a reconstruction. So it's, it's, it's a bit of an individualization to give you the best fit of what you need. 
But to give you a bit of guidance, the partial mastectomy is what most women end up having and or choosing because for an invasive cancer, partial mastectomy plus radiation will give you the same outcome as a mastectomy. So why would you want to take it off unless you needed to? So it is patient preference. The tumor has to be smaller than five centimeters, a favorable location. What I'm trying to say is if you have a, a size triple A breast with a four centimeter tumor just underneath the nipple, we may not actually may be able to make it look very good if we do a partial mastectomy. So there are, there are variations on a theme here. Only one tumor and your ability to tolerate an anesthetic plus the radiation because that will give you the same outcome. But telling you most people it's the right thing to do and it's preferable for most women. Kind of giving you a graphic, that's where the lymph nodes are and that's where the lumpectomy would be in the breast. <coughs> And for a small favorable tumor, this is her lumpectomy site. Way up here somewhere, there's her lymph node site. So, you know, it doesn't make that much of a psychological impact. You have radiation after that, and you do well, and it doesn't remind you every day that you've had a breast cancer And you, for a small tumor. And remember, the smaller the tumor, the smaller the scar. So if you choose to come along with a giant tumor, it takes a bigger scar to get it out. This is just throwing in another type of imaging, which you'll hear all over the news, which is an MRI. And actually, this is, this is one breast. This is one breast. And again, the MRI, the breast hangs through, which is why it looks so droopy. This is showing, this had, person had a little tiny thing on a mammogram, but the brilliant white stuff is what you're looking at. This breast is normal. All these little white spots are normal. But you can see this whole ductal system right up to the nipple was involved with tumors. So sometimes the MRIs are very helpful. They'll tell you it's quite a bit bigger than you thought it was, especially the ductal carcinoma in situ. So instead of a little bump like this, you can see that you almost can't do a partial mastectomy in this patient. She will require more if you want to get around it because it's a way bigger than we think. And ductal carcinoma in situ can do that sometimes. It can go down a whole ductal system but never form a lump. Why would we do a mastectomy? Well, sometimes I said the patient prefers. For her, that's a more comfortable thing. It's a better thing. Sometimes, actually, for the elderly patient, it's simpler than sending them for radiation for, for a month. So there's, there's many reasons. But the concrete reasons are more than one tumor. It's a large tumor. Remember, I just showed you the picture of the tumor that went for the entire length of the breast. And the inability to tolerate radiation because a lumpectomy without radiation has a much higher recurrence rate than is necessary. It's at least 30 to 40% recurrence rate. For most women, that's too high. They don't want to do it again. Mastectomy will take the whole breast, and it actually takes up the whole chest wall, and I'm showing the lymph nodes in the armpit as well. So it removes the entire area there, but the muscle and everything else important is left behind. And what does that look like in the end? There is a mastectomy in a, in a young woman, so it's a, it's a bigger scar. You can certainly wear prosthesis, but I think this one, this isn't one of Nancy's patients. This one went on for a reconstruction on that breast, a delayed reconstruction. So you can reconstruct to look fairly reasonable as well. So that's the breast. And I always separate into what I do with the breast and the lymph nodes. Remember I said this is a mix and match. The no, whether the, whether the cancer has gone to the lymph nodes really predicts whether this cancer is going to come back, gives us the behavior. So the, the nodes, the lymph nodes in the armpit, we really need to know what's going on because the treatment will depend on that. Taking all the lymph nodes is really basically the standard of care, at least it has been, but there's a sentinel lymph node now where we take less lymph nodes for hopefully the same benefit, which is now much more, well, I do it more often than not because you're taking less for more, much more palatable option. The breast is injected Two, two ways, one with a radionucleotide dye, the radiologist does that, and then we do a blue dye. This travels to the first draining lymph node, so instead of taking the whole pile in the armpit trying to guess where it might be, we're targeting the first draining ones with these, the radionucleotide and the blue dye that will go down the lymphatic to the first ones, the first one or few in the chain, and take those ones. You still have to take them at this point in time to make a diagnosis of whether the tumor's gone there, because sometimes there's only two or three cells in a corner and there's no way, there's no imaging that we've got that will give you that information. And this is showing you a patient who's had the fine wire that I talked about. So her tumor was not feelable. So this fine wire has been put in by the radiologist to mark the spot that we're going to take out. This is the blue dye that we've injected in the breast. 
I don't know if you can see it, but in here there's a little blue lymph node in her armpit that the blue dye helps us see it. And this lymph node, and I can't remember if there's one or two in this patient, that's all we're taking out. So she's going to end up with a little scar there, a little scar there, tumor comes out, lymph nodes come out, and she looks pretty good, and she gets the best of care. But you can see that's a much smaller procedure than the mastectomy I showed you. We can't do it if there isn't a breast to inject. We can't do it, or we shouldn't be doing it, if you can already feel tumor in the lymph nodes because you need to get rid of it. You need to take all the lymph nodes if there's already tumor in it. So if we know there's tumor in the lymph nodes, this is not a procedure. The sentinel lymph node is a procedure to try to avoid taking lymph nodes that do not have tumor in them. If you're pregnant, we're not sure about the radioactive dyes. And if you, I'm putting a question mark, if you have a big tumor, like bigger than five centimeters, the chance of the tumor having gone to the lymph nodes is at least 50%. So it might not be the best thing. Surgery has come somewhere in the last few years. This is, you note, 1700s, where they didn't have an anesthetic. So this is a way of getting that breast off in one quick, swift blow. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have been more, more instruments like that. But in all honesty, breast cancer in that time was regarded as a lethal disease. The surgery was way worse than the cancer. People knew you had to have cancer, but if you had surgery, you're much more likely to die faster. So, and you, know, you didn't have an anesthetic, so you can't sit around a whole lot of time waiting for someone to cut you. So these were the kind of things that they did do because they did realize that if you get the whole breast off, you had a better chance of survival, but getting it off was not a pleasant thing. When, <laughs> see, I woke you up. <laughs> surgery is a little bit better than it used to be. <laughs> when, now, I'm talking about the surgery. We've done a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, and the surgeon has done their bit. They've gotten rid of the tumor. They've figured out where you are at, whether your nodes are positive. But there's, breast cancer is a multidisciplinary treatment. It isn't just the surgery. It never ends there. Virtually, we have one of the highest cure rates in I think all of North America and BC, because it's multidisciplinary. No one's a hero here. It's a multidisciplinary. The surgeons, the radiation oncologists, the medical oncologists, it's a team of people. And occasionally, sometimes, you'll actually need the chemo first if the tumor is too big. It makes it smaller so that we can operate on it. So, like I said, it is an individualized treatment depending on what you need. For those other treatments, the radiation and the medical oncologist will say, how big is it? Lymphovascular invasion that means is the tumor gone into the lymphatic vessels in the breast because that's not a good sign. The grade, that depends how aggressive it is. There's receptors on the tumor. There's HER2. You've heard about Herceptin, the expensive drug that they fought about in Ontario. It's tumors that mark with this are more aggressive and there's treatment. And how many nodes are involved? How many? How big are they? And those are all the things that the, the other doctors will look at to predict, okay, what treatment do you need from here on in? Because the idea is to Try your very best to cure this. Indications for radiation are post-lumpectomy for virtually any cancer. Post-mastectomy, for those people who have nodes positive or margins positive. So sometimes, some people say, well, take the breast off and I don't need any radiation. Well, sometimes it isn't that simple. If the nodes are positive or if the margins are positive, they'll still add radiation to prevent, to try to prevent that tumor from coming back. And certainly with node positivity, there's actually been a number of studies that suggest the actual survivals are higher, probably because it's not coming back, because it is actually a local treatment, and recurrent or metastatic disease. <coughs> Chemotherapy. I'm not going to make you memorize this, but I'm just basically saying a lot of women will need chemotherapy. And at this point in time, if you're premenopausal or you're maybe postmenopausal but under 65, you almost have to have a tumor that's less than a centimeter to avoid the considerations of chemotherapy. So it's, it's much more broadly applied because the cure rates are higher. Because it's not the tumor in the breast that's going to get you. It's the cell that lodges in your lung or your liver or your brain. And those are organs that you need and without you can't do, so they want to kill it off there. Some women will need hormonal therapy as well so that there's not just chemotherapy. Hormonal therapy used to be for post, mostly postmenopausal women, and it still is, but they'll add tamoxifen to the premenopausal women if their tumor requires estrogen to grow. And what we really want at the end of the day is you out there rowing the boat. If you have breast cancer with the dragon boaters, I will point out that this is me here. And this is, <laughs> this is the famous H picture when the Falls Creek teams came up and we came down sideways. And I'll point out <laughs> that these women all have cancer and they came in not last. <laughs> they still came in second to last. <laughs> That's it for me.